Howdy folks, welcome to the sermon. Um, one of the things that's been bothering me recently uh, has been the how the English language, they take uh, certain words and they take certain phrases from other languages and they absolutely butcher the pronunciation. These things should be pronounced acai, this should be pronounced library, this is not bagel, it's bagel, this is not milk, it's milk, this is a gif, not a gif. Those examples are great, but none of them were more earth-shattering and, and revolutionary than when I found out that one of my favorite foods, focaccia bread, was actually pronounced focaccia. When I think of the word hospitality, my mind is first taken to my mother's or my grandmother's kitchens and being served a warm plate of focaccia bread, being made coffee, or mom spending hours in the kitchen making a delicious supper. The reality of our current situation is, we don't see each other that much anymore. My whole point of this sermon, my whole point of the next part of this sermon was to tell you that people don't visit each other that much anymore. And as I finished writing this paragraph and finished writing a great section on how people don't visit each other anymore, my doorbell rang. Uh, my first question to myself was, did I order Domino's and forget about it? Turned out it was two of my friends who socially distanced and visited me from Yorkton, and they just came into my house. And that brings me to a really, really interesting point, which was the reason that I bought this house in particular was I wanted to create a safe space where people felt like they could come in, drop by, pop over whenever they felt comfortable. Um, I wanted a house that people could come to knowing that they're going to have a good time, they're going to laugh, and they're going to feel safe when they arrive here. Unfortunately, we live in a current society where most of the time the only instance in which we see the inside of somebody's house is on a, a really old series of MTV Cribs. And so when I thought and got to the idea to talk about hospitality, my condition was that it needs to be talked about without ever talking about what goes on inside the home. And that led me to three questions that we need to discuss. How did Jesus demonstrate hospitality and how do his actions translate to modern actions? How do you demonstrate hospitality? And how do we receive others' hospitable actions? Uh, but before we can start that conversation, we first need to talk about what is hospitality. Uh, through going through the Latin roots of the word, I was eventually led to the word hospital, which is where hospitality comes from. And then as I did more and more research, I was led down a path that led me to the word hospice. I thought the definition of hospice was fascinatingly intercorrelated with what we find in the Bible. Uh, Wikipedia defines hospice as uh, prioritizing comfort and quality of life by reducing pain and suffering. And to me, that verbiage just sounded way too similar to passages that we read in the Bible, some such as Luke 10, 25 to 37, the parable of the Good Samaritan. 1 Peter 4, verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. 1 Peter 5 verse 10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you a strong, firm, and steadfast. Colossians 1 verse 24, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Galatians 6 verse 2, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. And finally, Hebrews 2 verse 10, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should be made the pioneer of their salvation, perfect through what he suffered. To talk about hospitality in the Bible, we first need to return to the Old Testament. And one story that sticks out to me is the story of Abraham and his three guests. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. 
Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way, now that you have come to your servant. We can look a short time later in the Old Testament to Lot's visitation by two angels and how Lot treated them. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night, then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Some other stories that uh, that immediately make me think of people being hospitable in the Old Testament would be uh, Rahab offering her home to the Israelite spies, uh, Abigail providing hospitality for David and his men when they needed a rest, uh, Zarephath providing hospitality for Elijah when he was facing starvation, uh, the Shemanite woman providing Elijah with a furnished room for him to lay his head uh, whenever he passed by. Those to me seem like really great examples of Old Testament hospitality and what that looked like in an older era. Observably, all of these acts from the Old Testament involve people's homes, and I don't think that that's something or, or an element of hospitality that we should deviate from. I think in our modern society, inviting someone into our home carries a lot of weight and it also carries a lot of trust with that person that makes them feel respected and honored. One of the commentaries that I was reading, and, and one of the more difficult things to observe with these Old Testament stories is that all of these stories, what they did is they brought people closer to God through their hosting and through their hospitality. In my commentary that I was reading, I found the concluding verse or the concluding sentence that they used to pack a particular punch that I loved. That sentence said this, it said, acts of hospitality or inhospitality revealed the underlying good or evil of a person or community. If we fast forward to the New Testament, we see our Lord and Savior demonstrating these qualities as well. Uh, Jesus served as a unique and obscure demonstration of what hospitality can look like. Jesus served a unique dual identity role as both the guest and the host in the situations he was in. And as you may know from many of the New Testament stories, Jesus is visiting with some of those guests. <coughs> Zacchaeus, provoked certain criticisms from the people that were around him. Jesus experienced the vulnerability and rejection of a stranger the second that he entered the world. Luke 2 describes Jesus as being born in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The Bible is clear that the stranger or the alien, as the Bible so lovingly puts it, is at the forefront of those requiring and deserving of our hospitality. As both a guest and a host, Jesus challenged the prevailing but sometimes unrecognized socio-religious patterns of exclusion that existed in society. In Luke 5, he invites Levi, a tax collector, to come and follow him. In Luke 7, he is anointed by a sinful woman. And then in Luke 19 later, Jesus has supper with Zacchaeus. Jesus' teaching in hospitality is distinctive on its emphasis in welcoming those who appear to have nothing to give in return. I think given the events of these past weeks, that needs to be something that the church and all Christians need to proclaim. Jesus welcomed others into conversation with himself. His medium was often the dinner table. Uh, consider this question for yourself. What is your medium for inviting others into your space. For me, the medium that I frequent is an app called Discord. And Discord is an app that I use with my friends while we're playing video games with each other. Uh, there we've talked about our faith, we've helped our friends work through their divorce, uh, we've compared the differences between Catholicism, Christianity, and my other friends' uh, religious belief systems, we've learned about each other's struggles, and we've laughed and enjoyed life a lot. Uh, some of my other mediums are my classroom. For you, that might be your cubicle that you have at work. Uh, my phone, texting others for me is a medium of conversation and a medium of building others up, but also talking people through the problems that they're having in life. Uh, the bar, I've used the bar many times to talk to my non-Christian friends about 
why I don't drink or why it's important to me to go into bars in the first place as a Christian. Uh, conversations, person to person interaction, by its very definition by physical science, conversations travel through air. Air is a, is a medium. Um, based on the fact that it has an index of refraction, uh, which is the same value as, as, as um, basically a vacuum because it's pretty much the same index of refraction, but it still has an index of refraction, which means by definition that it's a medium. And as such, that means that we have conversations in a medium. My version of hospitality is very similar to a dinner table and a hospice. Uh, anything that I can provide a person with to prioritize their quality of life and their comfort by reducing pain and suffering, to me is hospitality. For me, that may be uh, making them food, that may be playing video games with them, or that may just simply be having a conversation in some sort of space with them. For some of you, your skills are sympathy and empathy. Your personality by its very nature welcomes those who appear to have nothing to give in return to you. And you have an innate ability to prior prioritize their quality and comfort of life through your sympathizing, your empathizing, your understanding, and your patience. Your conversation, wherever that, that may be and however they that may be happening, is a hospital to that person. Uh, to those strangers, your conversation has the ability to heal and also inform them about God's grace, love, and mercy. Uh, for me, I suck at empathy and I'm terrible at sympathy. I think both of those qualities are awkward and uncomfortable. Humans are incapable of being everything to everyone. While you wonderful people with your great skills are sympathizing and empathizing with those who need it, my hospital bed will be one that focuses on providing smiles, joy, and laughter. As with Jesus, I and people like me uh, welcome those who appear to have nothing to give in return. Um, but what we try to do is we hope to supply them with the healing power of laughter, joy, and smiling. And through that, we try to show them the joyfulness that exists as being part of God's and Christ's kingdom. Hospitality has often been thought of, of revealing and nourishing somebody by feeding them and giving them a safe place to sit down and to have a conversation. Well, what if we remove the element of food and just had those safe conversations? What if we were able to show that same hospitality by playing a round of golf, by going for a run, by going for a walk, by swimming with them, by uh, playing video games, for example? Now, the last point that I want to emphasize is the receiving of hospitality. Like Rogers in Saskatchewan, our reception of hospitality is often horrible. We live in a selfish generation that has a very poor uh, knack for receiving love, receiving gifts, or receiving hope from any other person. Thus, we as a church, we need to lead the way in demonstrating how to receive hospitality and how to receive love from other people. Jesus and his disciples were the most clear example of being dependent upon others to receive hospitality. And a clear example of that is in Luke chapter 10 verses 38 to 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what it was better and it will not be taken away from her. There's a story from comedian Michael Jr. about reception that goes like this. Imagine you pull up to Starbucks, and when you pull up the, to the till after ordering to pay, the clerk tells you that the person in front of you has paid for you. What should you do in that moment? Well, Michael Jr. being a comedian, uh, he sends up a quick prayer, and he drives off with some free Starbucks. Uh, next week, he returns to the same Starbucks, and lo and behold, as he's pulling up and getting ready to pay, the clerk approaches him and says, you won't believe this, the last 27 people have passed on payment for the car behind them. Michael Jr., being a comedian, tosses up a quick prayer and drives off with some free Starbucks. Now, the question of the story is, is Michael Jr. being a bad person, or did the first 26 people ahead of him just have a really hard time receiving the gift? His argument was that the first 27 people had a really, really hard time receiving that act of love and that gift. 
Uh, I would encourage you to watch the rest of that little section. It's about the first five minutes of the video. And he talks about another scenario where you encounter a homeless person and you have a bottle, an extra bottle of water in your hand. And I want to encourage you to watch that little segment, laugh along, but also learn from him. Uh, the end of his conclusion or the end of his point of this whole example is that obedience is better than sacrifice. In other words, sometimes it's better to be obedient and to receive hospitality than it is to sacrifice your own self or to pay for the person behind you at Starbucks, uh, sometimes it's better to just obey and openly receive the gifts and the situations that others are providing you with. I think many of you will find that the reception of hospitality from people who don't normally give it is a greater gift to them than you providing your own service. When I was coming up with an idea for this sermon, I, I came up with the idea for the title of Hospitality Without Walls. And that's part of the reason that I'm doing it outside of my house as well. Um, I don't know if you've been able to hear on the mic, but neighbors have been walking past, birds have been flying by, and people have been listening to the words that I've been awkwardly saying to my phone positioned on a weird instrument of levitation from my mom's house that I stole from her. Thanks, mom. Um, but my whole idea was that hospitality needs to go beyond the walls that we have and the borders that we have of our house and beyond the dinner table. The Bible gives us many great examples of what hospitality can look like at a dinner table, but I think it needs to extend beyond that as well to whatever place you're in. Uh, in education, one of the biggest things and one of the biggest ideologies that's talked about is creating a safe space in your teaching classroom. And I think in a normal conversation, we need to be that portable um, house that we can take around, that portable safe space that we can be where we can reduce others' pain and suffering. Um, and we can do that through showing Jesus' love. To me, being hospitable in a conversation means not making somebody feel like they're unaccepted or unwanted or undesired, but making them feel like they have a place in your life and an important role to fulfill. Um, similar to what Christ did with all of us, telling us that we each have unique gifts. He gave us a role a, a, and a job to fulfill while we're here dutifully on earth. We all have the same job as well, which is to make fishers of all men. Um, but we also have individual roles within that grand schematic of God's plan for our earth. To conclude, and to repeat a lot of the ideas that we've said so far, uh, the main priority of your hospitality should be to prioritize the comfort and quality of life of others by reducing pain and suffering. And you can imagine so many ways in which we can bring God's kingdom into that statement. Second is that Jesus' teaching is very distinctive and clear on us providing hospitality to those who appear to have nothing to give in return. The third idea is that your medium for hospitality changes. It's not necessarily the walls or borders of your house, but it's your presence and it's your personality and it's how you carry yourself into conversations that can be a hospitable environment. When you're having your next conversation with Jesus or with the Holy Spirit, um, whether that be through prayer, worship, uh, or a legitimate conversation, here are some of the questions that I'll hope you consider. What is your medium? Are you a sympathizer, empathizer, or a joy bringer? How do you use the reduction of pain and suffering of others as a segue into sharing Jesus' love? Uh, my grade 12 students will tell you that I offer, I try to offer very tangible goals and tangible challenges, something that you can do each week. And so here's my challenge for you this week. I want you to take out one piece of paper and you can use whatever pen, pencil, whatever you feel is necessary. I want you to plan to have a conversation with somebody. That might be you running into them, that might be a conversation with your children, it might be a conversation with a friend over the phone. And one of the things that I want you to consider is how were you hospitable? And I want you to write down things that you said that maybe didn't welcome that person or didn't welcome Jesus to be emphasized in the conversation that you were talking about. Uh, write down some of those ideas, make a game plan for how you can involve Jesus in that conversation. And if it does work, great. If it doesn't, write about why it didn't work so that you can be prepared to be more hospitable for the next person that you encounter. Uh, I hope you enjoyed today's sermon. Uh, we will hopefully see you all soon at our lovely North site. Uh, and I look forward to talking to you all on Tuesday. And we will see you then. Peace.